Okay, here we are. We're back. We're covering chapter one of physics 125. So chapter zero was why physics. Chapter one now is about uh, units of measurement and standard units. Very important. Uh, we need to be able to speak the same language within science, between different countries, between different scientists. And the language of physics is mathematics. And the language of physics is also the units that we use. So we need to be able to communicate with one another. These first several chapters, one, two, and three, are going to be about uh, gaining the tools that we need to be able to, to do, be able to do physics effectively. So these are kind of preparatory chapters, very relevant chapters, but preparatory and not directly about the physics content itself. So why are standard units important? Why do we need to be consistent in our measurement? A little cartoon here for you to read about two men who are going to make a cart together and they agree they're each going to make one wheel and the wheel is going to have a diameter of three cubits. Now a cubit's a very old unit. Uh, the measurement from the tip of your elbow to the tip of your middle finger, really convenient measurement because your arms are with you all the time so you can measure off of your own arm. Uh, but as you can see from the picture, the two individuals are of different heights. Therefore, they have different length arms. Therefore, their cubits are different. So they each build a wheel, and their wheels are not the same size, and this is not going to go well for the wagon. So we need a consistent uh, type of unit so that when I say a meter and you say a meter, we, we mean the same thing, and we will measure the same thing. This is very important uh, to be able to repeat experiments or to be able to duplicate uh, research or uh, even you know, the simplest thing like this, to be able to build a wagon that, that works. Just everyday manufacturing, we need to have consistent units. So their the units developed slowly over time. There was the old English system of units, which uh, even the English don't use anymore. We still use them in the United States and a few other very tiny countries, but the vast majority of the world has moved on to metric. But let's talk about the English units because their history is a little easier to understand. Uh, they understood that people had different size feet, so they lined up 16 people and uh, heel to toe, and they called that a rod. Then they divided that by 16 and they called that a foot. So it was an average of 16 people's feet effectively was the definition of a foot. But if you grab people from the same area, they're going to tend to be either taller or shorter, perhaps. And so you're going to have inconsistencies uh, across different locations, different countries, etc. The inch was originally defined as three barley corns right next to one another. The yard was the distance from the king's nose to the tip of the king's finger. Uh, what happens if you have a drought? Um, what if the barley is not all the same? What if you get a new king who's taller or shorter? These all demonstrate the difficulties of using um, measurements off of an individual because individuals vary. Like I mentioned, only the U.S. uses these. Um, they are in our books some because we live in the U.S. Many of you are going to work in the U.S. and so these units are still uh, relevant. Uh, in the scientific community, the shift even within the U.S. has been to metric units. This creates a bit of confusion at times because within the scientific community, there's still stuff we need to have built for us by outside companies, and they, being American companies, tend to use English units. So a famous example of this, of course, is NASA was using metric units, and they had, uh, I forget whether it was Lockheed or Boeing, they had somebody build uh, a satellite for them to send it to Mars, it was the Mars Climate Orbiter, it was supposed to orbit Mars and, and, and study its climate. And it never went into orbit around Mars because there was a miscommunication. Uh, part of the problem was that the NASA guy assumed that it was in Newtons and the industry guy assumed it was in foot pounds. Uh, but the bigger issue was neither of them labeled uh, their numbers. And so there was a miscommunication. Uh, a number was sent that was assumed to be in newtons, but was actually in foot pounds. And so they fired the rocket for the wrong, um, with the wrong force and crashed the thing into the planet instead of going into orbit. So that was a very expensive mistake of units. So we're going to try to avoid unit issues by making sure we always label our answers and um, using metric for the most part in this class. Uh, I, I will use metric pretty exclusively in my examples on the slides, but you will have homework problems from the textbook in both English and metric. I do apologize for this. I wish it was not so confusing, but it's the reality of the country we live in 
and uh, the metric system that is strongly preferred by uh, the scientific community, and you're taking a science course. So you're gonna end up with, with both of those. Here's a table from your book. See, it's table 1.1. I will at times put tables from the book in here to make reference. Please make sure that you, you spend some time understanding the tables, even if they are not in the slides. This is talking about some of the basic units in the SI system, SI, um, originally from the French, but SI system international, the international system of units that are used uh, everywhere except for the United States. Uh, the basic unit of length is the meter, basic unit of mass is the kilogram, basic unit of time is the second. Those are the three we will use quite extensively. We will not get into the electricity part of physics, so we won't need to use the amp. We will talk about temperature. So we'll talk about the Celsius and the Fahrenheit and the official unit, the Kelvin. Uh, light intensity, we will not cover and moles, although you've got lots of that in chemistry will not be covered here in physics. So really the first three and just a little bit of the fifth one. And then we have the derived units that come from uh, the basic units put into, into combination. Uh, for example, volume is a three-dimensional measure, whereas length is the one-dimensional measure of length. Volume is the three-dimensional measure. So meters cubed or area, meters squared. We will use Newtons quite a bit. We'll talk more about where a Newton comes from and what units it's derived from uh, in chapter five. Meters per second, we'll talk about quite a bit in chapter four and subsequent chapters as we go into movement and how physics allows us to predict uh, the results of movement and what will happen next. And then joules for energy and watts for power. All those we will be using, all these derived ones we will use, uh, not all of the basic ones. So we've got many different sizes. The world exists in a lot of different sizes. This is the table for the prefixes, right? And they tend to go in sets of of orders, three orders of magnitude. So you've got a thousand of something is a kilo, a million of something is a mega, a billion of something is a giga, and a thousand billion of something, a trillion of something is a tera. Uh, and you put this prefix in front of your standard unit from before. So whether that unit is um, meters or, or grams, right? You could have a, a kilogram, a, a thousand grams is a kilogram. That's, that's our standard unit actually. Um, but you could have a kilometer, a thousand meters is, is a kilometer, or you could have a megameter or a gigameter or a terameter or a teragram. Uh, all these are ways of saying a very large amount of something without having to put a whole ton of zeros, right? You could say one gigabyte and it really stands for a billion bytes, but you don't have to write a one followed by nine zeros, you just write one gigabyte. Uh, we are more familiar with these prefixes now that we have uh, incredibly uh, powerful and large computers. We have megabytes and gigabytes and terabytes, and the processors on our computers are getting faster and faster. Uh, they're operating in microseconds, nanoseconds, and picoseconds in some cases for the very best uh, computer. So these are the prefixes you're going to need to know. Um, again, it's just a function of the fact that the universe we study is extremely um, large in orders of magnitude, right? Not only do the distances get very large as you go up into the universe, but as we go down and study the atom and the things inside the atom, the distances get very small. Uh, I'd recommend, if you haven't seen it, to watch the Powers of 10 video. The link will be in the description. The link is also in the notes on this slide. Again, all these PowerPoint notes are on Blackboard, and I would encourage you to download them and look through them in addition to watching these videos. Uh, but the link to the Powers of 10 video will be in the notes section of this slide, also in the description of this video. Uh, it's a very powerful dis demonstration of uh, just the many, many orders of magnitude that our universe involves. So you will need to know these prefixes. They will potentially be on the first uh, exam and the quiz over chapter one. So take some time to learn these prefixes. You've probably been asked to learn them in a previous science course, so hopefully that won't be too uh, difficult for you. So how do we convert units? How do we convert from one set of units to another? This is a challenge for students often in their science classes. They aren't real great at it. So we're going to go through the process, um, how one goes about doing it. You know, uh, again, one of the nice things about metric units is that the conversions tend to be simple. English units a little more complicated, right? 12 inches in a foot, three foot in a yard, so on and so forth. In the metric, it's always 10 or 100 or 1,000. 
So you're going to write down what you're starting with, right? This is very important. Uh, physics is, is a number of multi-step problems. And the key to being successful in a multi-step problem is to break it down into pieces. So the first thing we need to do is write down what we have that we want to convert and how many of them we have. And then we need to define uh, the units in terms of one another. So let's say we're going from inches to feet. We need to acknowledge that uh, a foot is equal to 12 inches. So, so we have 24 inches we want to convert and uh, one foot is equal to 12 inches. So then we create the conversion factor. And this is where people often have trouble with converting units. It's, okay, if I'm going from inches to feet, do I multiply by 12 or do I divide by 12? I don't remember. I got a 50-50 chance, but we don't want to be wrong half the time. So uh, create both of your conversion factors, 12 over 1 and 1 over 12. And then you multiply by the one that will appropriately cancel out the units. So those are the steps. Um, now we're going to do an example so that we can understand these steps a little better. So we want to convert inches to centimeters. That's the example we're using. So um, again, we, we want to convert 12 inches. So that's what we have. That's our quantity, right? Step one was state what you have and, and the quantity of what you have and the units that you're in. So 12 inches. Um, and then our conversion factor, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. That's the equivalency. So our two conversion factors is going to be one inch over 2.54 centimeters or 2.54 centimeters over one inch, right? So both of these are equal to one, right? This is a big thing in algebra that if we put uh, X over Y and if X is equal to Y, then X over Y, they're, they're equal to one another. So when we put them in a ratio, uh, they are actually one. And we can multiply anything we have in the world by one and it doesn't change the value. So. Since these two things are equal to one another, if we put inches over centimeters or centimeters over inches, the right amount of inches over the right amount of centimeters, these both of these fractions are equal to one. Now, which one should we use? That's where we sit there and say, okay, which one of these are we going to use? Well, we want the units to cancel out, and we know that the numerator and the denominator, if they are the same, will cancel out. So if we have 12 inches, in the numerator, if we multiply by inches in the numerator and centimeters in the denominator, we'll get a number, but it will come out in inches, inches times inches, which is inches squared, divided by centimeters. And that's not what we want. That's not a useful unit. That's not helpful. So we need to use the other one. The other one, we put 12 inches, inches in the numerator, and then 2.54 centimeters in the numerator and one inch in the denominator. Now we have numerator and denominator. Those two can cancel. We multiply through, we get 30.5 centimeters. That's what we want. We want it to come out in a single unit of distance. We were converting distance to distance. That's what we want. So that's the right way to do it. So that's how we decide which one of these conversion factors uh, we need to use. If you don't know your conversion factors, again, that's where your textbook is very helpful, particularly the appendices in the back of your textbook to give you uh, equivalent values like that. That's something you can look up. That's not something you need to memorize but you do need to know the process for how to use those equivalencies to do the conversion from 12 inches to 30 and a half centimeters. Of course, 12 inches is a foot. So the next time you look at a ruler, look at the centimeter part and you'll see that it comes out to be about 30 and a half centimeters at the end of the ruler. Okay, so here's the one that's a little more pertinent to our physics, to our discussion, right? 60 miles an hour, we wanna convert that to kilometers per second. So a mile is um, 5,280 feet, and an hour is 3,600 seconds. So we get 60 miles per hour. We've got one mile is 5,280 feet. We have one hour is 3,600 seconds. So we got two conversions here. I believe we're actually going from miles per hour to feet per second. I think that's a misprint. So we got to create our conversion factors. A mile is 5,280 feet. So it can either be one mile over the feet or the 5,280 feet over the one mile. And the same thing with the hour and the seconds, either the one hour over the 3,600 seconds or the other way around. See, now it got correct, corrected. So 60 miles per hour, the miles 
in the numerator will cancel with miles in the denominator. So we want the 5,280 feet over the one mile so that our miles will cancel appropriately. Likewise, we have hours in the denominator, so we want hours in the numerator so that those will cancel appropriately. And we'll end up with the only leftover units that haven't canceled being feet over seconds. So then we multiply all our numbers together, 60 times 5280, that's all of our numerators, multiply all the numerators across, multiply all the denominators across, one times 3,600, and then do your division. So when we did 60 times 5,280, we get a large number, and when we divide that by 3,600, we end up with 88 feet per second. So again, it's helpful to think of this in terms of algebra, to think of this in terms of numerators and denominators, that will make your conversions go better and more successfully. So another thing that we have to deal with, again, in this world of very large numbers, sometimes we use the prefixes, sometimes the prefixes are less helpful, particularly when we're about to do some mathematics. We don't really want to have to add kilometers and meters or kilometers and megameters. Uh, that's difficult because now we're gonna have to, we have, we're trying to add different units and that's difficult. So we often will also use scientific notation, which is a way to write a large number without a ton of zeros by using the power 10 to uh, an exponent. So the rules of scientific notation are pretty simple. Your part here in front is called the coefficient and it needs to be between one and 10. Actually can't be 10, it needs to be less than 10, but greater than one. It needs to be a single digit have a single ones digit. It can have a decimal after that, but a single ones digit, no tens digit. Um, and then that's multiplied by 10 to some power. So that power is called the exponent, um, the exponent of the power 10. And of course we know that 10 to the one is 10, 10 to the two is 100, 10 to the three is 1000. You keep going on like that. So effectively you're, you're adding zeros or you're shifting the decimal point when you multiply by some power of 10. So here we'd have an example, 586. We want to write that in scientific notation. We can write it as 5.86, right? Because we have now a coefficient, 5.86, which is between 1 and 10. And then we multiply that by 10 to the second, right? Because 5.86 times 100 would get us back to 586. And you might sit there and go, well, well let's see advantage here. I'm writing, I'm actually writing more digits when it's in scientific notation. And that's true. Uh, but we're just trying to show you some simple examples. Uh, this would be a more pertinent example. 4,687,000 is converted to scientific notation. 4.687, again, a number between 1 and 10 for the coefficient. And then our decimal point got moved. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 places to the left. Just like here, we move the decimal place 2 places to the left. So we end up with a power of 2. We move it to the left, we end up with a positive power of six, okay? 93 million, we've got to move it one more place, seven places, so it's 9.3 times 10 to the seventh. Um, if we were moving it in the opposite direction, if we had a number less than one, we'd have to um, be moving the decimal point, we'd be moving the decimal point to the right to get a number between one and 10. And when you move the decimal point to the right, you still count how many places you just then put in a negative exponent of that value. And we'll see some examples here on the next slide. So here are some examples. Take a moment, pause the video, and uh, see if you can write each of these five numbers in scientific notation. Uh, and then after you've uh, completed that, uh, continue to play the video, and you'll see the answers and see how successful you were. So here we have the answers. 100 is simply 1 times 10 to the second. 1 times 100 is 100. 4,321, I transposed the numbers, but you understand the idea, uh, becomes 4.321 times 10 to the third. Uh, how about this one? This one, I would guess, was the most difficult one for you. What, what do we do with 1.23? How do you put that into scientific notation? Well, scientific notation means you have to multiply by some power of 10. Uh, but 10 to the zero, 10, uh, any number to the zero power is, is one. That's just a definition of what the zero power means. So if we don't need to shift the decimal point, then it's just 1.23 times 10 to the zero. And that gives us 1.23 back. 
Okay, and then as we talked about, the number's less than one. Now we had to move the decimal to the right, so we only had to move it one place to the right, so it's 10 to the negative one. So 2.5 times 10 to the negative one, you can think of it as 2.5 divided by 10 will give us 0.25. On the other hand, this one, we had to move it more places, so it's 7.925 times 10 to the negative four, or 7.925 divided by 10,000 will give us back this number. So that's how scientific notation works. You want to be able to go from a regular number into scientific notation, and you want to go from scientific notation into a regular number, which we'll practice here in just a moment. Again, part of this class is about concepts and understanding ideas of how the world works. Part of this class is about learning the skills that help us engage these concepts and the skills that will be productive for us in life. Uh, these first chapters are a little heavy on the skills, right? Because we've got to have some skills before we can start engaging the concepts. Uh, persevere, work through it. We will get to the concepts. I promise it will be more fun later. But right now, we've got to do some practice and learn some of these skills. So same thing here. We're going the other direction. Now we have numbers in scientific notation. We want you to convert them out of scientific notation into standard form. So again, go ahead, pause the video and work through these four examples. And when you've worked through them all, then you can play the video again and see what the answers are and see how you did. Okay, here we go. So 10 to the third is a thousand. So that means we're gonna move the decimal four places to the right. Again, when we have a positive exponent, we're gonna move it to the right to get out of scientific notation. We were moving that decimal to the left to get into the scientific notation when we had a positive exponent. With a negative exponent, it's the opposite, right? We were moving it, um, we moved it to the right to get into scientific notation. Now we're gonna move it to the left to get back out of scientific notation. So 10 to the negative four means we need to move that decimal four places to the left. So that's gonna be three zeros and then our seven five, right? Because the first move is to get your digit behind the decimal and then you have that many more zeros. Um, again, it's not quite so simple for positive um, exponents because there's often numerous numbers uh, to the right of the decimal. So just because it's 10 to the third doesn't mean we end up with three zeros because we had uh, the one and the three taking up places um, that, that placeholders essentially. But this will, this will be much more consistent for the negative exponents as you'll see. So 9.8 times 10 to the sixth, we're going to move the decimal six places. So that gives us 9 million. 800,000, and then 5.67 times 10 to the negative eight. Again, we're gonna to need to move it eight places to the left, which is gonna mean seven zeros, and then our digits, five, six, seven. So that's scientific notation. Again, there'll be some practice problems on that in this chapter's homework and on this chapter's quiz. Um, there are some further example problems in the notes that will go through this, step, or I'm sorry, in the text, in the chapter, Text, there are worked examples. I strongly recommend you spend some time with those, especially with concepts that you struggle with or skills that you struggle with. Go look through their worked examples, follow their work line by line, um, rewatch the lecture. I, I work through it, but if, if you prefer to be able to see it line by line, sometimes the worked examples in the book are even better than the sound of my beautiful voice. So moving on to some of these other uh, measurement things that we need to deal with. We have this discussion of area, right? Area is two-dimensional, whereas length is one-dimensional. You get a meter stick or you get a string and you, and you measure the length of that string and that's a distance, a linear distance. But an area has a length and a width, so it's a, it's, it's a surface that you would have to paint. I always think of paint when I think of area, right? What is the area of the walls of the room that I want to paint? I need to measure how tall the walls are and also how wide the walls are, and then that will tell me the area, and then I can go to the paint department and they'll tell me that a gallon of paint will cover 400 square foot, and I can figure out how many gallons um, I need. So standard units in Metric system, of course, is the meter. So one meter by one meter would be one square meter. Or you could have one centimeter by one centimeter, which is one square meter um, or square centimeter. And that's what our little two button, uh, little two number, right? When we multiply something by itself, whether it's x times x or m times m, uh, you end up with that symbol squared because we have two of them. We don't have, uh, I said that poorly. 
It's not 2m, it's not m plus m, it's m times m. We're multiplying it by itself, so it's squared. Um, you can have square inches, square centimeters, square meters, and of course you can have things that aren't one by one, right? Five meters by three meters uh, is broken up, as it shows you here, 15 little one square meter boxes, so it's 15 square meters. So the inner rectangle is six by four. Six by four is 24 square centimeters, right? Four centimeters by six centimeters. They each give a centimeter, centimeter times centimeter is centimeter squared, 24 square centimeters. So what is the area of the white triangle? And now what is the size of the green shaded area, right? The shaded area, we, we, can, we can debate whether it's green or not, that's not important. The point is there's a shaded part, right? So how do we, find the area of the shaded part. It's not a simple rectangle. It's, it's kind of a rectangular ring around. So there's a couple ways you can find the area of that sh shaded green area. One way is to break it up into a series of long skinny rectangles, right? So we could have one that's 10 by two, right? If the whole thing is eight and the middle is four, that means the top is two and the bottom is two. So 10 wide by two tall on the top, 10 wide by two tall on the bottom. So 10 times two for the top. And then on the side, it's four tall and two wide. Again, we have a total width that's four centimeters greater than the inside width. So that leaves us with two on each side. So 10 times two for the top, four times two for the right, 10 times two for the bottom, four times two for the left. We add all of those together and that will give us a total of 56, right? 20 plus 20 is 40, and 8 plus 8 is 16. 40 plus 16 is 56. So that's one way to find the area of the shaded region, but there's another arguably simpler way to do that, right? We can take the rec total large rectangle, 10 times 8, and we could subtract out the inside white rectangle. So 8 times 10 is 80, minus our 24 that we got before, 80 minus 24 is also 56. So we get to the same answer. And that is not an uncommon thing in physics or that there's more than one way to get to the final answer. Oftentimes though, one of the ways is, is actually simpler than the other. So there's nothing wrong with doing it the, long, uh, the longer way. It will still lead you to the right answer. Um, but oftentimes we're, we're interested in, in the simplest a way to do the problem, which in this case would be 80 minus 24. But this is just a good example of how one goes about calculating areas. Um, so we move on from area to the idea of volume, right? So we had one dimension, which was length, two dimensions, which is area. Now three dimensions is volume. It's a length, a width, and a height. It's how much space there is inside of something, right? And we live in a three-dimensional world, right? We can draw a line on a paper, we can color a two-dimensional picture, but we live in a three-dimensional world. There's, there's three dimensions to the length of things, uh, to, the sh to the size of things. So you can have one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, that's one cubic centimeter or one cubic inch, um, but we have some special units of volume, some of which are uh, we do have units that are directly related to the length units, like both of these cubic inches, cubic centimeters. But then we have things like liters and quarts and pints, which don't directly relate to our linear dimensions. So we have to uh, work on figuring that out. So um, a liter and a quart are, are not the same size. A liter is slightly larger than a quart. If you try to pour a liter of milk into a quart container, it will overflow, right? Uh, but there are four quarts in a gallon, which means uh, there's there's a little less than four liters in a gallon. So when you think about gas prices and you travel to Europe, they sell gas by the liter instead of by the gallon. And you see, oh, well, the price is about the same here in Europe as it is in the United States. Remember, they're only getting a quarter, roughly a quarter as much gasoline for that price as we get here per gallon. So many uh, standard toilets are one gallon flush and sometimes they're made in not made in America, so they're labeled in liters. It's 3.8 liters, 3.8 liters or one gallon to the flush. So volume is your three dimension, right? But you can take a three dimensional object and you can take a slice through it, right? And when you take a slice through it, you're basically eliminating one of the three dimensions, right? This, this shaded region is a very thin slice that still has the width and the length 
I'm sorry, the width and the height, but does not have the length of the box. So we call that cross section. A cross section out of this box is the blue tri uh, blue rectangle. And then we look at that cross section over here. This is very common in process control, very common um, when you're talking about pipes and how much um, area there is, how much product can flow through the pipe. Is, it's a function of the cross sectional area of the pipe. It doesn't really matter how long the pipe is. Uh, the thing that affects flow is, is what is the size of the cross-sectional area. So that's something that we'll have the opportunity to calculate. And of course, most pipes are round, not rectangular. So that makes the area calculation slightly more complicated, but it can be done. So here we've got just a, a discussion of the different sizes of objects, right? So we've got uh, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. That's one cubic centimeter. A centimeter starts with C, cubic starts with C. So a cubic centimeter has been abbreviated as a CC. That's what they call it in the medical field, right? You might give, be given um, a thousand CCs of, of fluid through an IV in the hospital or um, just 10 CCs of some kind of medicine or something like that. That's what the CC is. It's cubic centimeters. It's a volume of liquid. Uh, that they're administering to you. In science, we define a cubic centimeter as a milliliter, a thousandth of a liter, right? Milli was one of our prefixes. It's abbreviated lowercase m, and it means a thousandth of something. So one centimeter cubed is one thousandth of a liter. So they're trying to show you that here in this next picture, that if you have a cube that is 10 centimeters wide and 10 centimeters long and 10 centimeters high, then it's 10 times 10 times 10, that's 10 times 10 is 100, times another 10 is 1,000, that's 1,000 cubic centimeters. A 1,000 milliliters would then be one liter, one liter. So one liter is 1,000 milliliters, or it's 10 centimeters cubed, right? So um, this is maybe, maybe you remember this from math class, they, they had these uh, sticks of 10, and single individual cubes. And then they have these large cubes that were 10 on a side. Uh, a liter, if you wanna think about what kind of volume that is, most people are familiar with a two liter bottle. It's, it's half of that. But we can go on and up, right? So a meter cubed would be a meter on each side. Well, a meter is a hundred centimeter, right? Centi is a hundredth of something. So a centimeter is only a hundredth of a meter. So this is not a meter along the side. It's 10 centimeters. We need 10 of those cubes next to one another to get uh, a meter. So now we, we go up, we, we add another zero to this. A hundred centimeters by a hundred centimeters by a hundred centimeters would be one cubic meter. And a hundred times a hundred times a hundred is in fact a million. So a million cubic centimeters or a million milliliters is a cubic meter, and that's a thousand liters. So that's a box that is one meter stick, or one, again, a yard stick, a meter stick, or pretty close, one meter stick wide, one meter stick long, and one meter stick tall. That, that would be a very large volume to fill with water or something like that, uh, but that's a cubic meter. So we will deal with all three, all of these volume measurements in physics at various times. Um, Again, this box is six by four by five. So six, uh, five times four is 20, 20 times six, 120 cubic centimeters. Uh, the green layer or the shaded layer is just six times four. Six times four times one, right? It's only one centimeter tall. It's not the full five centimeters tall. So it's 24 cubic centimeters. So just examples, examples of area, examples of volume. There'll be more examples in the homework, more examples on the quiz. What is the surface area of the box? So again, this box has a volume, which we could um, calculate. It's actually the same volume as the box we just had on the previous page. So we're not going to go into the volume. But what is the surface area? What is the area on the surface, right? Again, in physics, we're very fond of descriptive names. The area on the surface. So uh, it's a rectangular box. Uh, they have labeled four sides, but there's also a top and a bottom, right? Um, think about a dice, right? How many sides are there to a dice? A dice has one through six on it. So there are six sides on a standard dice. 
Um, so there are six sides that we need to uh, add together to find the total surface area of the box. Now, the easy thing is that some of the sides are the same, right? One and three have the same dimensions. They're six wide and five tall. Two and four have the same dimensions. They're five tall and four wide. And then the top and the bottom have the same dimensions. So we'll just work through that. Six sides, two of each, two of side one, one and three, two of side two, two and four, and two of the top, top and bottom. So side one is six times five. Six times five is 30 square inches, but we have two of them, one and three. So 30 times two, 60 square inches from sides one and three. Side two is five times four, five inches times four inches is 20 square inches. We have side two and side four. So 20 times two is 40 square inches. And then finally, we have the top. It is six long and four wide. Six long and four wide. Six inches times four inches, 24 square inches times two is 48 square inches. So then we add all those together and we get a total surface area of 148 square inches. And then what is the volume? As we said, volume is simply length times width times height. There's only one volume to this box. Therefore, it's a single calculation. Six times four times five is 120 cubic inches. Again, notice how the units of our answer come directly out of the units of our inputs, right? Inches times inches, square inches. Inches times inches, square inches. Inches times inches, square inches. If we add square inches together, we're going to get an answer that's square inches, okay? But if we multiply by inches three times, then we have cubic inches. It's a great way to check your math. Many people who come to physics, uh, they struggle a little bit in physics because there's, there's math that you need to do in physics. And sometimes they get the physics wrong, not because they don't understand the physics, but because they did the math uh, incorrectly. The units are a great way to check yourself when you're doing the math and to make sure that you're doing it correctly. The units... You usually, based on the question, can know what the units should come out to be, right? Volume is three-dimensional, so my units should come out as uh, a cube, okay? And if they don't, then that might mean that I did my math incorrectly. So mass and weight. These are, of course, measures of how much stuff um, makes up material. We call it matter. Matter is a, a, a fancier name for stuff. We don't have a great understanding of what matter is. It's this, the, this, I keep saying stuff, that's, that's what it is. The stuff in stuff that makes stuff take up space. Um, but we have mass and then we also have weight and there is a subtle difference. Mass is the how much stuff is in you. The weight is how hard that stuff is pushing downward on the ground or on whatever's below you due to the gravity uh, where you are. Now we'll get into much greater discussion of the difference and what causes the difference in chapter five when we learn about forces and when we learn about weight. But what I need you to understand right now is that they are different and therefore they have different units. Um, mass is measured in grams, used grams a lot in chemistry because you were using small amounts of stuff. In physics, we will do more kilograms, thousands of grams that we will use as our standard unit. There is mass units for the English system. Nobody uses them anymore. They're called the slug and the stone. Maybe you've read them in some old English book that you were reading sometime. Nobody uses slugs or stones anymore, but those are units of mass from the English system. The weight units or the force unit that we will use is Newton. So these three in red are the SI units that we will use extensively. Uh, weight should be measured in Newtons. Obviously, we also use pounds and ounces here in America to measure weight. A newton is slightly less than a quarter of a pound. So if you convert your weight from pounds to newtons, the number is going to go up. But remember, just because the number goes up doesn't mean you weigh anymore. It just means you're using a smaller unit to weigh yourself. Just like if you express your net worth in pennies, the number will be bigger, but you really won't have any more money. And then, of course, there's 16 ounces in a pound. Uh, we have balances and scales. Uh, a balance tends to uh, measure the mass or the weight electronically. The scale you place known masses or weights on one side and the unknown object on the other. And when it uh, becomes equal, then you say that, that you've achieved um, equality and, and you take the knowns and you add them together and that's the unknown. Uh, it would be nice if one of these was for mass and one of these is for weight, but, but that's not the way it is. In fact, some people would call this 
a balance instead of a scale. And some people call this a scale or a balance. The words are used interchangeably. There's no good uh, consistent definition for either one. Balances and scales measure both mass and weight. And we'll talk about why they're used interchangeably on Earth um, and why that is not so true if we go other places besides the Earth. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's for chapter five. So you've probably been taught about significant digits before. Uh, you've been taught about precision and accuracy before. They, they bring this up in every science class. It's difficult for people to understand uh, what any or all of this means. So I'm gonna give it my best shot and hopefully you'll come out of this with some more understanding than you had before of this concept. So exact versus approximate numbers, right? We would prefer to be exact. We love to be exact. We, we want to be as, um, perfect as possible, but that is not always possible. In fact, it's rarely possible. It is possible sometimes, right? Counting. Counting is exact. Um, if we were in class together, I would look out over all of you and I would count how many people are in this class. And I would say, look, there's 15 humans in this room. I don't know if anybody's pregnant. That's irrelevant to the discussion. There's 15 humans in this room. There's exactly 15. There's not 15.1. There's not 15.2. There's not 15.001. There's exactly 15 people because we can count. Right, And we could count the chairs in the room, we could count the desks in the room, we could count, um, I was going to say we could count the ceiling tiles, but sometimes you have partial ceiling tiles. So anything that you can directly count, you, you effectively have an exact number. But that's not what we do most of the time in science, most of the time in life. Most of the time we are not counting, we are measuring. And when we are measuring, you know, we look at uh, where, the, say, the, the width of the desk. We, we put a meter stick on it and we try to measure the width of the desk and we find what two lines it's between and we estimate and then that's a measurement. It's not exact. It's as good as we could get, but it's ultimately an approximation. And so we want to know in science just how, how much the number was approximated. And that's where this discussion of accuracy and significant digits and precision, all this stuff comes up is we want to know if you say, oh, the desk is a meter wide, we want to know what you mean when you say the desk is a meter wide. Did you, uh, did you guess it just based on your idea of about what a meter is? Did you have a stick that was exactly a meter and you said, oh, it's pretty close to the width of the stick? Did you actually have a meter stick and you measured it down to the closest centimeter or millimeter and it's really 1.00 meters or 1.000 meters? See, that, that's what we're talking about here is how close to a meter are we really and how do we know when somebody uh, states that something's a meter wide what they mean. And that's where verbally it's, it's not helpful at all, right? If I say the desk is a meter wide, you have no idea. But this is why we'd write things down and why how we write things down is very, very important. So again, the accuracy is going to depend. And, and again, I apologize. Accuracy and precision have different definitions from different people. I'm using the ones in the book, which I think are, are valid and good definitions. But if you go to the internet, you'll find, you'll find a web page where somebody defines precision with what we have written here for accuracy and the other way around. It's just, there's just not consistency, okay? People are different, people think about things differently. This is what our book says, this is what will be on the quiz and the exam. This is a, a useful way to think about it. So the accuracy is really a description in many ways of the instrument you're using to take the measurement, right? So if my meter stick has marks for centimeters and marks for millimeters, then my meter stick can have an accuracy down to the millimeter. Um, on the other hand, if I just have a stick that somebody cut off and said this stick is a meter long and there's no marks on it, then my accuracy is just to, you know, the meter. Um, so, so the ones place versus the thousands place, and that's not near as accurate. So we indicate this with uh, what we call significant digits. How many numbers are there in the measurement that tells us uh, essentially the accuracy of the instrument. So we'll talk about an example. There's a chart, uh, and I strongly recommend you look at these charts and examples on, on these next, for these next couple of slides, because accuracy and precision is a challenging concept for most people. So again, the accuracy is the number of digits in the measurements. So if the table is 1.423 meters wide, then that's an accuracy of four significant digits. Um, the precision is the smallest unit with which the measurement is being made. It's essentially the last significant digit, right? So 
Um, again, for that same example, if the table is 45.62 inches long, uh, we have an accuracy of four significant digits and the precision is the hundredths place, right? The precision is really less about the number. It's not that the number, the precision is two. It's that the precision is the hundredths place or the hundredths of an inch or 0 0.01 inches is the precision because we're measuring it down to the hundredth of an inch. We were able, based on our instrument, to measure it that precisely. As I mentioned, not universal definitions. If you look on page 39, it will talk some about precision. So accuracy and precision. Now let's talk about what we do when it comes time to do math. Because it's fine to just say, oh, well, that was an accurate measurement or that was precise measurement. But then we, we take these measurements, right? That's often the data that we collect in a science class. And then we try to do something with that data. And when we go to do something with that data, uh, we often have to do math to it. So what do we do with these numbers when we go to do math? And that's where um, you know, the math rules of significant digits come in. So here we're gonna talk about a calculation. What happens when you add 100 meters and 0.1 meters? Add 100 meters and 0.1 meters. So you know we can get this, we can get our calculator, we can do this, maybe we don't even need our calculator, we, we can do this, right? 100 plus 0.1, it should come out to be uh, 100.1, right? Uh, but that's not the correct answer here, and we'll talk about why that is. So when we are adding or subtracting, what we need to do is we get both the numbers in the same units, right? So this is where it's not helpful, right? We could say this is one, or this is 10 centimeters. What's 100 meters plus 10 centimeters? Well, that's less helpful, right? Because when we go to do adding or subtracting, we need them in the same units so that we are, we are adding them in inappropriate values. So we already have them both in meters, so that's good. Then we do the operation, 100 plus 0.1, we get 100.1, but then this last one is extremely important. You need to round the result to the least precise measurement, okay? And again, remember precision is the place value of the least, of the least significant digit in the measurement. So here we have a one in the tenths place, right? So for that measurement, it's tenths. But for this measurement, those zeros are just placeholders. And again, there's a wonderful chart in your book about zeros and when zeros count and when they don't. And it's very important to understand that these zeros do not count, they're just placeholders. So the last significant digit is in the hundreds place, the hundreds place. So we've got hundreds and tenths. So we need to round the least precise, right? As you go to the right, you're becoming more and more precise, right? Measuring something to the nearest gram is less precise than measuring to the 10th of the gram, which is less than to the 100th of the gram. So the most precise is the furthest the, beyond the decimal, right? So hundreds is way less precise than tenths. So we need to round our answer to the hundreds. So 100 plus 0.1 is 100.1, but when we round it, it becomes 100. So 100 plus 0.1 is 100. And that seems extremely uh, non-intuitive, right? That is not what we expect to happen. That would make your math teacher very angry. Your math teacher understands that when you add something to a, a value, you're gonna get a value greater than what you started with. That just, that makes common sense. But what we have to appreciate is that numbers in science don't mean the same thing as numbers in math class. In math class, they make the numbers up. In math class, they count. In math class, everything is exact and there's no uncertainty. Right? But in science, we get these numbers from our measurements and there's uncertainty. What do we really mean when we say 100 meters? Again, 100 meters means something very different than 100.0 meters. And, and, and this is part of the reason why we like scientific notation, right? Because if we wanted to indicate that one of these zeros was significant, but the other wasn't, there's no way to do it uh, the way that number is written. There is a way to do it, with scientific notation, we'd write 1.0 times 10 to the second, and then we would see that the one and the first zero were both significant. But when we say 100 meters, what we are really meaning is that um, it's about 100 meters to the, to the closest 100, right? It's not zero meters, and it's not 200 meters. It's closer to 100 than it is to 200, or than it is to zero. That's all the more um, we mean when we say 100 meters in this way. 
it's like looking at somebody and saying, oh, they're, they're about a football field away from me, right? Because a football field's 100 yards, roughly 100 meters. So when I say, oh, they're about a football field away, that means, well, they're not two football fields away, and they're not half a football field. They're, they're about one football field away. So then, you know, if I say, well, they're about a football field away, and then I take a baby step backwards, and I ask you, I'm sorry, yeah, a baby step backwards, because we're, we're increasing the distance we're adding. I take a baby step backwards and I say, how far away is the person? Well, they're still about a football field away, right? Um, it, it's kind of similar to the joke that I've heard told about the man who took his friend to the, uh, to the Natural History Museum and they went to look at the dinosaur bones and he told his friend, these dinosaur bones are 65 million and three years old. And his friend looked at him and said, how do you know that, that, that correctly that they're that old? And he said, well, because I was here three years ago and the guide said they were 65 million years old. And that was three years ago, so they must be 65 million and three years old. And we appreciate um, the ridiculousness of that in the context of that joke, right? But that's exactly what we're talking about here. Because the 100 was an estimate to the closest 100 meters, we can't sit there and say that increasing or decreasing by 10 centimeters is going to change our estimate. Right. If we were, if if we said, okay, what's 100 meters plus 100 meters? Well, if I say he's a football field away and I walk backwards about a football field, well, now he's two football fields away. That makes sense. But if he's a football field away and I take a baby step backwards, he's still a football field away. And that's why 100 meters plus 0.1 meter is still 100 meters. That's that's how you get there. That's why we get these odd outcomes. Okay. And that's why your math teacher. Uh, wouldn't like it, right? Because when the math teacher says 100 plus 0.1, they mean exactly 100 plus 0.1, and then you get 100.1, okay? But the math teacher isn't making measurements. They're making up numbers or they're counting things, and therefore um, they do what they do. But we live in a scientific world. We collect data. We are learning how to do math on the data that we collect, right? This is a lab class. We will do labs, and so we need to understand how to appropriately process these numbers, which is why measurements are so, why units are so incredibly important, right? Because the, the measure, the units will tell us uh, whether it was a measurement or whether it was a counted thing or, or that sort of thing. So if somebody just throws numbers at you with no labels on them, then you have no idea whether you should use math rules or science rules to do the math. And that's again, why units are, are very important. And here, of course, I, I have no units on this slide, but I have units down here in the blue. So. So those were the rules for addition and subtraction. We have different rules for multiplication and division. Similar, but different. Um, we use accuracy this time instead of precision. So here we've got a problem. If we have 15 chairs in each of 15 classrooms, how many chairs are there in the building? The building has 15 classrooms. There's 15 chairs in each classroom. How many chairs are there total in the building? So. The rules for multiplication and division, you get the numbers in, in the same units. That doesn't really apply here. Um, you do the operation, 15 times 15. You round the result to the same number of significant digits or significant figures as the least accurate measurement. Okay, Again, accuracy is your number of significant digits. So 15 has 2. 15 has 2. So we do 15 times 15. We get 225. Two significant figures, two significant figures, so we should round to two. You know, the, the two and two, the least of two and two is two. If one was two and one was three, we would round to two. Um, so 225 has to be rounded to two significant digits, so we get 230 chairs. That's what, uh, that's what the answer says. So where did we get five extra chairs, right? Where did those extra chairs come from? Which classroom are those five extra chairs in? So what, what, what's going on here? Um, first of all, we, we should not have followed these rules um, because these are both exact numbers, right? We counted the chairs. Counting is exact. So this 15, when you have an exact number, it actually has, a, we consider exact numbers to have an infinite number of significant figures. So you never are limited by uh, the exact number. You're, you're limited by the other number. And that, that will often happen, right? We might have a situation where we say, uh, you know, I measured the dimensions of the desk and then I counted how many desks were in the room. What's the total desk surface area in the room? And that would be 
that would be a case where we'd have an exact number multiplied by a measured number and we would take the, the accuracy of the measured number only as a limit. But in this case, they're both exact numbers, so there should be no limiting um, of our exactness of our accuracy. So we should not have rounded this. There are truly 225 chairs exactly in those 15 classrooms. Um, but if this had been a measurement, if we were measuring a desk that was 15 inches by 15 inches and we were asked for the area of the desktop, why would it be more appropriate for us to say 230 square inches than 225 square inches? Um, again, this comes back to the fact that we're measuring and what does accuracy mean? So when we say the desk is 15 inches wide, what we're saying is it's closer to 15 than it is to 14 or 16. So there's some uncertainty, there's some range there, right? And then in the other direction, the same thing is true. So if you took 14 times 14, which would be the minimum possible area, and you took 16 times 16, the maximum possible area, um, that's gonna give us quite a range, right? And if we say that the, the, the desk area is exactly 225 square inches, we're indicating that we know it much better than we really do. The reality is because these are both uncertain in the ones place, this area is gonna be uncertain in the tens place, right? Might be 230, it's, it's closer to 230 than it is to 220 or to 240, but we don't know exactly where it is around 230. We don't know that it's exactly 225, okay? And that's because these measurements um, were only so accurate, okay? Now, if this was 15.0 and 15.0, and we knew that the desk was between 14.9 and 15.1 inches wide, then yes, absolutely, we would have a better idea of the precision of that area. But because of the limits of our measurement, we have to limit the uh, reported answer once we've done math with that measurement. So that's why we have these rules Hopefully that made some sense to you. Again, there'll be some more practice for you with this in the homework. And the last thing we need to talk about here is this idea of order of operations, something that you've uh, dealt with before, the order in which you're supposed to do mathematical operations. Um, and there's the mnemonic, at least this was what I was taught when I was a kid. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. First, you should do anything in parentheses, then you should do the exponents, uh, like we talked with scientific notation, those are exponents. Then we do the multiplication and division, correcting for our significant figures as we go. And then we do our addition and subtraction, again, uh, correcting for, well, in this case, doing the uh, correction at the end, right? So the reason we need to do that, right? Like if we go back to our football field example, right? Um, if I said, oh, he's a football field away, and then I take a step back, um, and I say, ah, oh, he's still about a football field away, and I take another step back, right? If I take 100 steps back, um, then it's going to affect the fact that he's a, a football field away, right? So, and that will happen sometimes when we're doing math, right? You'll have to add things uh, multiple times, and so you should do all that addition first, and then you should round to the least precise value um, at the end. So 100 plus 100 one-foot corrections, uh, does come out to be 200 because uh, if we if we did it as we went then then um, we, we'd never round away from from them being one football field away uh, but multiplication and division because of the nature of those processes you need to do it as you go but addition and subtraction you do it at the end which again I understand is confusing uh, but that's simply what we need to do to get the most correct answers in the end that are defensible and explainable in terms of data for science. All right, this is the end of chapter one. I will see you back for chapter two when we'll talk about the fine art of problem solving.